32 and verse 24. It says, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he had, did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the daybreak. For he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. And Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. He said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved just as he crossed over Penuel the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Now, we, we see here that God interacted with man, but this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is his pre-Bethlehem, him acting, wrestling with this man. It wasn't God the Father, right? Because he, he said, you can't see my face. So here we see the Lord wrestling with him. Jacob said, I've seen God face to face so Jesus, the Son of God, acted, was a part of the Trinity that acted and, and, and touched man and spoke with man. In fact, if you could just go over to Genesis 18. Genesis 18. And we'll see again, the Lord appeared. Uh, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord appeared to him by the Terabithia, Terabith tree of Mamre, and it was sitting in the tent of the door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, bowed himself to the ground. Listen to what he said. My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Please let a little water be brought to wash your feet, rest yourselves under the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts, and after that you may pass by, insomuch as you have come to your servant. They said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hurried into the tent, and Sarah said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender good calf, gave it to a young man. He hastened to prepare it. So he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree and they ate. Then they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, here in the tent. He said, I will certainly, listen to what he says. I will certainly turn to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door, in the, in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were well advanced in age, and Sarah was well past the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being so old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too, too hard for the Lord? And at that appointed time, I, notice first person, I will return to you, according to the time of life, and Sarah will have a son. Who is he interacting with here? It's Jesus. So we see that the Trinity, you know, the, the part of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that interacted intimately with man, and interacting with, with all of the prophets, and interacting any, any, any vision or any personal engagement was the Lord Jesus Christ, pre-Bethlehem. He, he engaged with them. He interacted with them. He told her, here he said, I'm going to come and she's going to get pregnant. I'm going to do that. Is anything too hard for me? And so we see here again that, 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 that this pre-Bethlehem, these pre-Bethlehem years, Jesus was active in going out and in, in, in bringing about God's will in the life of man. In fact, if we're in Genesis, go to Genesis 15 and we'll see the father and the son. In verse 8, it, it, he says, this is Abraham speaking. It's, he says, Lord God, how shall I know that I shall inherit it? 
So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him. He cut them in two down the middle, placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Then the vultures came down on the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, notice verse 12. Now when the sun was going down upon Abram, behold, a whore of great darkness fell upon him. So there's that darkness that we've seen in Exodus. And he said to Abram, know of a certainty that your descendants will be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and will serve them. And they will afflict them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they shall come out with a great possession. Now, as for you, you will go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. Now, I want you to notice something here. I want you to notice verse 12. It says, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. In other words, he went into into a deep, very deep, deep sleep and darkness completely covered the area, and then God spoke this over him, okay? Verse 16, And in the fourth generation they shall return, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch passing between the pieces. So now, Abraham is still asleep. And we see that the father and the son pass between the pieces. This is a a covenant that was made. So Abraham prepared the covenant, but the father and the son made an agreement with one another. And so it it says a burning, let's go back to it, 17. It came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, there appeared a smoking oven, one entity, and a burning torch, another entity. So the two pass between the pieces, and they bound themselves contractually one to another. Verse 18, and on the same day, the Lord, that's Jesus, pre-Bethlehem, made a covenant with Abraham. So here we see what's called the hypostatic union. And we see that, that the father and the son made an agreement, and then the son and a representative of humanity made an agreement. So what happened that day was our salvation was sealed to the seed of Abraham. These these two contracts, one between the Father and the Son, and then the Son and humanity, locked us together. And, you know, this isn't our teaching today, but this union, this locking together, all of the things that we've seen Jesus do and have to do to secure our salvation, to secure our eternal life, to move us from condemned and unrighteous to righteous and going to heaven, sonship and in heaven, was, a, was based on this relationship. The Father swore, if you do this, this is what I will do for them. Jesus said, if you do this, if you have faith in me as the Lord and Savior, this is what I will do to you. And so we see here in the Old Testament, Jesus was very active. We want to understand him, right? He was very active in the Old Testament and bringing us together, binding us together. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 and verse 4. It says, Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, Christians, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, but made himself. And I want you to see that Jesus, by his free will, uh, bought into God's plan. I mean, it's very important to understand that it was the will of Jesus to serve the Father by faith and to go through what he went through. So when 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 we look here at what he did, he said, but made himself, in other words, Jesus made himself of no reputation. Jesus took on the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of man. He decided to become a man, and being found in appearance as a man, he, Jesus, humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. 
Therefore, God has highly exalted him in giving him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? So here we see that Jesus, you know, because we, we want to understand him again, Jesus, by his free will, accepted God's plan. God's plan was you have to be born into humanity. You have to become a servant to man. You have to teach them our ways. And we'll go through that later, later in the teaching. So, so Jesus, you know, humbled himself unto death. So think about it. He created all of humanity, right? And then we got humanity falsely judging him, whipping him, beating him, spitting upon him, and hanging him on a cross. I mean, think about that for a second, who they were doing it to and where he came from. And so we see that Jesus used his free will. His love for us kept him, his grace. The Bible says he despised the cross for the joy that was set before him. We're the joy that was set before him. And so Jesus left this place of heaven because that was God's will to come into the earth to save us. And at any point, he could have delivered himself. At any point, he could have said, these people are not worth it. You know, in fact, if you look over, go to Matthew chapter 26, in verse 50, it says, But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? This is at his arrest. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish with the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide for me, more than 12 legions of angels. But how then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must thus happen? And so we see here that, you know, when we take Philippians and we take what we see here in Matthew, you know, Jesus took this all the way. He took this from his birth all the way to giving up the ghost on the cross. At any point, he could have walked out of this. But he stayed the course of faith with the Father. He obeyed the Father's plan all the way, all the way to the cross, all the way through the humiliation, all the way to death itself for us. Amen?